Good morning, everybody. It is great to see you here at the Vista today. My name is Austin Fisher. I am one of our lead pastors. Uh, today we are in the third week of our series called Skeptics Welcome. And it's a series that we like to do every couple of years or so because we realize that we live in an age of enormous skepticism, which probably shouldn't come as news to any of you. Uh, I mentioned the first week of the series that we actually right now, we're living in the middle of the largest exodus from faith of any sort, not just Christianity, but any sort of faith in the history of the world, that we are a people who are losing our faith at a rate never before seen in the history of the world. And yet this, uh, this crisis of faith also comes with a unique set of opportunities because think about it. Do we ever really grow when we're complacent and comfortable? Right? Think back on those seasons of your life that shaped you, that stretched you, that sharpened you, that matured you. Were those complacent, comfortable seasons? No, right? The only growing when we do, do the only growing that we do do when we're complacent and comfortable is growing soft and lazy, right? Both literally and figuratively. Um, or to use a seasonal analogy that's probably a bit appropriate. A summertime kind of faith that grows easy and nice and pleasant. Um, but the signs are telling us that summer is ending and winter is coming. Which means that faith might not come as naturally for you and me or for our children as it did for our parents or our grandparents. Which might not be the worst thing in the world. Because while faith grows easy during the summer, it grows lean and resilient and focused during the winter. So instead of sounding the doomsday alarms or wishing we lived in a year-long tropical paradise, we need to quit whining, bundle up, step out into the winter and seize the opportunity, the opportunity to starve off a lazy, soft faith. And to that end this morning, uh, I'd like to do something a little bit different. Now, most of us are probably familiar with a psychological phenomenon called confirmation bias, right? It just refers to the tendency to seek out and interpret new evidence in ways that confirm what you already think. People are quite good at challenging statements made by other people, but if it's your belief, then it's your possession, and you want to protect it, not challenge it and risk losing it. And if we're honest, I think this definition has basically all of us nailed dead to rights. Right? Because while we all like to think we're very rational, objective people, all of the rational, objective evidence tells us that we're not very rational or objective. I know what we do is we go seek out evidence that already confirms what we already believe and while we're really good at challenging other people's beliefs we're really bad at challenging our own beliefs we don't play fair when it comes to our own beliefs and I've seen this a lot lately um I recently released this book about faith and doubt and because of that I've had a lot of conversations with believers and unbelievers and one of the things I've noticed is how rarely believers and unbelievers really talk to each other and consequently, how little we really understand each other. It's, it's almost like we lock ourselves up in a room with people who agree with us. And then we talk about how silly and wrong everybody outside the room is. No? Uh, this survey came out actually this morning, like right before I got up to preach. And this is from the Barna Group. And it found that evangelicals are less likely than most people to have friends who are different than them, especially when it comes to religious beliefs. 91% of us say we mostly just hang out with people who believe the exact same things we do. And so here's what I did. I went and had a conversation with my friend Jeff, who's a barista at the Starbucks up down the road. Uh, and I talked to Jeff because he's kind and open-minded and very thoughtful, and he's also not a Christian. You know, he didn't grow up in a Christian household, going to vacation Bible school, so he does not and cannot take for granted so many of the beliefs that come naturally, that come second nature to you and I. He looks at the world, and he tries his best to make sense of it, and Christianity does not appear to him to make the best sense of the world. And so instead of me standing up here, talking to a room full of people who basically already uh, completely agree with me about Christianity, fanning the flames of our collective ignorance and confirmation bias, uh, I went and shot a video with Jeff, and we're going to watch it together. And so let's sit back and watch it with an open mind and a generous heart and see what we can learn from Jeff. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is my friend Jeff. Jeff didn't grow up in a Christian household. Um, and so I wanted to talk with Jeff a little bit to give a lot of us a perspective that we don't have. Jeff would probably consider himself agnostic or something close. Yeah. I had him give us a list of reasons why he finds Christianity difficult to believe. And so the first thing that you mentioned was the problem of evil. And so in Christianity specifically, we're told that God is all loving, all powerful, and all knowing. Right? And yet, horrendous evil and suffering exists in the world. I think with free will primarily, you go back and look, and you know, if God is supposedly you know all powerful, all seeing, you know, all loving, 
then just as easily as Adam and Eve ate the apple. He could take all that free will away in a moment and send them back to yeah. being, you know, totally pleasurable, you know, and totally self-contained within the Garden of Eden. And I think for me, it just, it doesn't work. You know, I've seen great bad and great good. And when you look at it, I think attributing it all to God, it takes away what humans are and what humanity is. It takes away self-responsibility and saying, you know, he may be evil and have, you know, done all these terrible things, but God made him do it. It was all yeah. within God's plan. And same thing for great and good. If anybody does, you know, good things out of the goodness of their own heart or because they feel like it, it's attributed to, well, God, yeah. you know, told me to, or God made him do this. Second thing you mentioned was the concept of heaven. And so a lot of religions, but then Christianity specifically talks about heaven as this state of like continual bliss, maybe even obliviousness to all pain and suffering. And so you said that that almost sounds torturous to you. You know, what better way to convince people to, to believe in, you know, this one all-powerful everything being than saying, hey, if you do every single thing that I ask, you get to go to heaven. It's like, here's, it's like the heaven cookie. It's, you know, you do everything that I ask of you without question, and you get to go to the big pearly gates and be happy forever. And in a way, I think that almost degrades human happiness, because part of being happy is you have to make it through the suffering and the pain and a lot of the horrible things in this world. But it makes happiness so much more worth it, because you made it through all of that. Happiness here on Earth is good because you have to live through the suffering because it makes it so much more worthwhile. Yeah. Okay, the third thing you mentioned was closeness to God. You've talked to some Christians who have said something like when they pray, they have this experience of God's closeness and this deep serenity and peace about the world. It's how hard can you force yourself to believe in something that you can convince yourself that it's 100% true. How hard can you pray before your brain is like, this is the feeling that I want, the feeling I know I want to have before it gives it to you, before it releases all the dopamine to your system and makes you feel you know, good, you look across every religion, you know, and they all have the exact same feeling whenever yeah. they, they pray or they reach nirvana or they, you know, feel close to their God. And it's like, how come across every single religion like this, some that would even be blasphemous to, to Christianity, they're getting this feeling of like the Holy Spirit entering into them. So how can all these different religions, worshiping all these different gods, have the exact same experience? Somebody's wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, the last one you mentioned was about the Bible. Um, and so, you know, you've done some research on this and from what you understand, um, and you're right, there is no original Bible. Right, you know, it's like you said, it was written across three different languages, translated hundreds of times to current times today, things were added, taken away, pastors today disagree on what's true and what's false. You know, it's really easy to take something that happened, do an actual historical thing that happened 30 years ago, drag it 30 years forward, write about it, and just change history a little bit. I think it's hard to use it as such a source of, of fiction, like all of your belief has to go towards the Bible because it's the only word of God that you have. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of belief to put in a messy, complicated book. A lot of faith. To say the least. A lot of faith, yeah. Um, so I thought it'd be cool to wrap up by just asking you, you know, you, you don't believe, you know, in Christianity. You have some hard time uh, rationalizing some of it. So what do you think, though, it might take for you to get to the point where you said, you know what, I think maybe Christianity is the truth? I don't know. That's... That's a hard one for me, you know, anything short of a miracle, obviously, I think would be, would be difficult, but maybe some mass feeling that, you know, every human being in their brains at once is like, God is real, everyone feels it at the same moment, something universal that we can all experience together, that, that it would take, because on an individual level, I think it's, it's hard for your brain, you know, like, to not fool itself into, into completely believing that, so I think it would absolutely have to be something that everyone around the world can feel together in the moment. Well, man, thank you for taking the time to talk to us a little bit and give us uh, a super articulate, thoughtful perspective of what Christianity can look like sometimes when you're not on the inside of it and when you're looking at it from the outside. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thanks, buddy. All right, so I asked Jeff to tell me some of the main reasons he finds Christianity difficult to believe in, and he gives me these four kind of key perennial challenging topics. The problem of evil belief in the afterlife, the ambiguity of religious experience, then finally how complicated a book the Bible is, and we kind of peel off that initial surface layer. And so I just want to make two really simple observations. Uh, first off, Jeff is not an idiot, right? On the contrary, he's a very smart, thoughtful, reasonable person. He's got questions, and he went looking for answers, and the answers he has found in Christianity so far have not been satisfying. You don't have to be an idiot to not believe in God. All right, second, Jeff is not an evil person. He doesn't believe in God, but doesn't even have horns or a tail or anything. Uh, on the contrary, he's a very kind and thoughtful person. In fact, he's even given me a free cup of coffee before. And no greater love is there than a man give a father of toddlers a free cup of coffee. And I make these two really simple observations um, because I think all of us have this tendency 
to demonize people who disagree with us, especially over things that we find important. I won't speak for you, I'll speak for myself, right? I have this natural, just gut primal reaction when somebody disagrees with me over something that I find important, where my, uh, you know, my pulse quickens and my jaw starts to clench up a little bit, and if I'm not careful, I will so naturally demonize them in both my heart and in my mind and treat them very mercilessly. And I'll go out on a limb and assume I'm not the only person who is merciless to people who disagree with me over things that I find important. And so what I wanna do is contrast that posture of mercilessness that we tend to have with the posture scripture tells us to assume when we're talking to people who don't agree with us about our faith. All right, so let's turn to 1 Peter 3. We're gonna read verses 14 through 15. It's toward the very end of your Bible, 1 Peter. It'll be up on the screen as well. It's just after James, if you wanna look. 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 15. So it's pretty short. The writer says, But even if you should suffer for what's right, you're blessed. Don't fear what they fear. Don't be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks of you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do all of this with gentleness and respect. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, but do all this with gentleness and respect. First Peter 3, verses 14 through 15. So, First Peter is this letter that's written to this big group of churches in the ancient world, and these are churches that were by and large experiencing a very serious season of persecution, which makes the writer's advice all the more powerful. He says, hey, don't, don't be afraid when you're persecuted, right? Instead of expending all your energy on this fearful defensiveness, here's what I want you to do, right? Be faithful to Jesus no matter what it costs you. That's number one. Number two, be ready and able to explain the hope that you have. That's number two. And then number three, you better do all of this with gentleness and respect, right? And there's a lot to explore here in two quick verses. First off, the writer says that you need to be able and ready to explain the hope that you have. Right now, this doesn't mean you have to have a PhD in philosophy or theology or apologetics, but it does mean that you need to have some basic ability to explain your faith to the best of your ability. Every last one of us, not just me, not just people who get up here and talk, every one of us needs some basic ability to explain our faith to the best of our ability. And then just as importantly, notice that we're told we should be ready and able to explain the hope that you have. And when the unbelieving world looks at us, the question they should ask is, how could they possibly be so hopeful? And yet, when the world looks at us, I think the question they often ask instead is, why are they so angry? Why are they so defensive? You know, instead of being known for a hope that demands curiosity, I fear we're far too often known for our angry, fearful defensiveness. And I don't know about you, but when I get nasty and defensive about my beliefs, it's usually a sign of my insecurity and my immaturity. All right, so that's the first thing. Second thing, if we're going to give an answer for the questions people have, we need to be able to actually hear their questions. If you want to give good answers, then you need to be a good listener. Good listening is the prerequisite for good answers answering and I fear that we live in the middle of a culture that is rapidly losing its ability to really listen to each other we don't like to listen to each other we like to talk at each other because it's lazy and easy and it feels way better which is why I agree with C.S. Lewis when he says that one of the best signs of Christ's likeness in a mad angry argumentative world is the ability to be a good listener People should be around Christians and go, Nick, that person actually listens to me. They must be a Christian, right? It's a miracle. And then third, and most importantly, third and most importantly, the writer doesn't tell us what to say to defend our faith. No, instead he tells us how to say it. Right? The writer doesn't tell us what to say. Instead, the writer tells us how to say it. Now, New Testament scholar Dennis Edwards puts it like this. Peter does not share any specific recommendations of what the Christian defense should entail. Instead, he focuses on the motivation and manner in which that defense is to be made. Any justification for the Christian faith should be made with gentleness and respect. And this is going to drive some of you crazy, okay? Here's this golden opportunity for God to give us the perfect answer to explain and defend our faith. 
Right, here's this perfect opportunity for God to offer the perfect answer that will silence all the skeptical questions forever. And instead, God goes, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what to say. Hard pass. But you'd better be gentle and respectful when you say it, whatever you say. And I know the diehard, certainty-seeking rationalists in our midst want to pull their hair out and scream to the heavens and go, God, why won't you just give us the answers, man? We just want to be certain, and we just want everybody else to be certain, so why won't you deliver the certainty for the love of God? God, that's a good question. You know? So why won't God just deliver the answers and the certainty? Well, first off, because kindness is usually more persuasive than answers. Kindness is more persuasive than answers. Now, I've said this before, but it's impossible for you and me to comprehend just how unlikely the rise of Christianity really was in the ancient world. Okay, It was birthed as this impossibly small deviation of Judaism, which was itself this impossibly small religious sect in the ancient Roman world. Right? It's this religion that is literally built upon the worship of a dead, crucified, disgraced Jewish criminal. Right? His chances of survival should have been nil. There ain't no future there. You don't want to invest in that stock. And yet, against all odds, Christianity grew. And it spread. And it literally remade the ancient world <clears throat> on a level that you and I can't comprehend because this is all we've ever known. Christianity remade the world. And how did it do that? How did it do that? Was it because Christians had all the best answers? Was it because Christians had all the political power that they had taken control of the House and the Senate and the Supreme Court and the presidency? Was that it? Or was it because Christians wrestled the world into submission with their arguments? No. No, Christianity remade the world because Christians lived beautiful lives. And everybody knew it. And everybody saw it. They visited prisoners. And they welcomed strangers, and they created hospitals, and they cared for the sick, and they paid attention to people that nobody else paid attention to. Christianity remade the world literally through the power of infinite, indestructible kindness. And our kindness makes a more powerful case for our faith than all of our argumentative answers ever will. About a month ago, I got on Twitter, and I asked, hey, what's the best reason to not be a Christian? And I thought I'd get a lot of responses like the ones Jeff had given. The problem of evil, the Bible's complicated, the ambiguity of religious experience. But instead, the most common answer I got was this. The best reason not to be a Christian is Christians. That's what most people said to me. The best reason to reject Christianity is Christians. And that's heartbreaking, yeah? So God chooses to tell us how to defend and explain our faith instead of telling us what to say because God knows that our kindness is more persuasive than all of our argumentative answers will ever be. And then second, perhaps God declines to give us the perfect answer to use to explain and defend our faith, because there is no perfect answer. God doesn't give a perfect answer because it's not a perfect answer, so let me explain a little bit here. Apologetics is a technical term, I used it earlier, that just refers to the defense of the Christian faith. And when you step back and you look at the long history of apologetics, okay, so all of the arguments and answers and proofs that Christians have come up with over the years to defend the faith, one of the things you notice is how much the answers and arguments and proofs have changed over the years. They haven't stayed the same. Right? For example, early on in the history of Christianity, we see a lot of historical arguments for the truthfulness of Christian faith. People would say, well, I'm a Christian and I believe that Christianity is the truth because I believe that Jesus was resurrected because my great-grandma Lucy saw Jesus when he was resurrected. Right? And that's a very persuasive proof. Like if your great-grandma Lucy had seen resurrected Jesus, she would probably be a Christian too. But now, 2,000 years later, none of our great-grandma Lucys were around to see resurrected Jesus. Right? Uh, and so all the kind of historical evidence is so far in the past that we can't find it as persuasive as earlier generations did. And that's fine. We just can't find it as persuasive because it's so far in the past. So, as the times evolved, the proofs for Christianity had to evolve too. And as humanity moved into the age of reason, kind of known as the Enlightenment, we start to see a lot of the rational and philosophical proofs because those were the proofs that made sense to those people. Right? We start to see the classical proofs about contingency and causation in the universe, right? So things like it seems so obvious that the universe has to have a cause outside itself. That there has to be a first mover who sets everything in motion <clears throat> that the universe can't explain itself by itself. And those are all very, very powerful proofs. They were incredibly powerful back then. They're still powerful now, but they're not perfect. 
they're not perfect, and we now see that they can't provide any sort of objective certainty about the truthfulness of Christian faith. I mean, who says that the universe can't cause itself? You? Well, who are you? What do you know? Right? You ever stood outside the universe to see? I didn't think so. And then even if those proofs could prove there was a God, they don't prove that the God who created the universe was the Christian God. Could be the God of Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism or who, whatever religion you made up. You know, like there's no definitive proof there. And I could go on and on, but I think you get the point. Different people in different ages find different things persuasive, so there is no perfect answer. And again, I know this drives the kind of rationalist black and white thinkers crazy, and I'm sorry, but I'm not the one who created this big, wild, crazy world, so you have to take it up with the big guy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've talked with a lot of people about faith and doubt over the last couple of months. And one of the things I've learned is that certainty-seeking black and white rationalism comes in both unbelieving and believing form. I've talked to unbelievers who are just so certain that they're right and can't believe anybody would be so stupid as to not agree with them. And I've talked to believers who are just so certain that they're right and they can't believe that anybody would be so stupid as to disagree with them. And I don't know about you, but I have just never found that the certainty-seeking black and white rationalism maps onto reality very well. It works great when you're just in your head thinking all your thoughts, but man, as soon as you get out into that world, you see that thing fall apart so fast. This big, wild, crazy world of ours laughs at all of our attempts to turn everything into a nice, tidy math equation that we can factor out easily with no remainders. I mean, I have, I have staked my life on the belief that there is a God and his name is Jesus. Most of you have too. But I understand how people don't believe it. I don't agree with them but I can certainly understand them, and I would hope you could too. And so where does that leave us, you know? Impossibly small creatures in this big, wild, crazy world forced to make enormous decisions about things that we just can't be certain about because that is our situation. Well, I don't know where it leaves you, but I'll tell you where it leaves me. I'll tell you why, despite everything and all of my uncertainty, I'm still a Christian. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why I think Jesus is the truth. You know, I think there's something to the historical proofs. I think something happened 2,000 years ago and the tomb was empty. That's what I know. Something happened and the tomb was empty. And I think there's something to the kind of classic rational and philosophical proofs. I do think the universe struggles to explain itself by itself. And then I think there's something to the experiential proofs. I think that both I and humanity at large have experienced things for which God is the best explanation. And then you put all that together, and I think there's something to the cumulative proofs, which just means that when all things are taken into account, I do think Christianity provides the best total explanation for this big, wild, crazy world. And yet, all that said, none of those things are the reasons why I'm a Christian. Right? Nobody, like, proofed me into becoming a Christian, right? Those are all great. They're helpful sometimes, but I'm not a Christian because of those things. I'm a Christian because of Jesus, and here's what I mean. Um, a few years ago, I had a, a pretty severe crisis of faith. And I'll make a long story really, really short by just saying that none of the typical answers that had worked for me were working anymore. And so it was like I took all the answers I knew and all the answers I had been given and all the answers I could find and I put them on the scale, you know. And while they moved the scale a little bit, they just couldn't decisively tip it. And so I thought I was going to have to walk away from my faith. And the only thing that kept me from walking away from my faith was Jesus. I couldn't walk away because I had been captivated by the story of the God-man. Right? Jesus of Nazareth, the infinite God, touching lepers, embracing sinners, partying with outcasts, preaching a kingdom of redemption and revelry, dying for the transgressions of every last sinner, and saint resurrected as a harbinger of a looming apocalypse of love. And y'all, I just got to tell you, once you have heard that story, and you have felt that story, and you have lived that story, everything else will let you down. It, it, it ruins you. And so while I realized I still had questions, and would probably still have questions and would probably always have questions, I realized that there was no way in heck that I was gonna walk away from Jesus. I realized that Jesus was so singular, so unexpected, so beautiful, that I would rather be wrong about him than right about anything else anyways. And your story, is, it's not the same as mine, which means your reasons won't be the same as mine, and that's fine. But if there is anything that all of us, believers, 
unbelievers and skeptics and saints, if there is anything at all that all of us should be able to agree on, it's that there ain't never been nobody like Jesus of Nazareth, y'all. There hadn't. Jesus is lightning, and we can still feel the thunder, echoes of an event, a happening, an eruption of beauty that still haunts, animates, and summons us and does so as strongly today as the moment when it first struck. And so if you don't believe, that's okay. And I really can understand, but you need to understand that you're missing out. Let's pray. Gracious God, it would appear as though winter is falling upon us here in the Western Christian world, which provides challenge and very great opportunity because for too long our faith has come too easy. So it's grown lazy and it's grown soft and it's time to trim off the fat a little bit, become focused and lean. So for those of us here who are believers, we ask that you would help us to become good listeners. Please help us trade in our angry, fearful defensiveness for an aggressive and hopeful kindness. May we explain and live our faith with gentleness and respect. And we pray for those of us here and many who are not who are unbelievers. We understand that belief comes really hard for many, that different things make sense to different people. And so we ask that their hearts would be open and receptive to the hope and beauty of Christian faith. And we ask that both they and you would forgive us for all the ways in which our hostility and hypocrisy have made their belief harder than it should have been. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that 2,000 years ago, something happened. And the world has been a very different place ever since. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to give ourselves a few moments to respond, which just means a few moments to slow down. Right? Don't think about what you've got to do on Monday. Don't think about what you're going to get for lunch. Be here where your feet are. Let God get beneath the surface and do the deeper work that God probably wants to do today. Now you can respond by standing and singing. You can respond by sitting and praying. You can respond by coming forward to receive communion, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Even if you find it hard to believe, it's still broken and shed for you. Or maybe you want to talk to somebody. Maybe you say, man, I got some questions and I don't really know what to do with them, but I feel like the next thing to do is to take a step toward Jesus. That's fine. Start there. We got people behind the back in the sound booth who would love to talk to you. Respond however you want, but be here where your feet are. Slow down and respond.